working on a 1995 uh, Indy engine. I'm just going to flip the camera view around here real quick. There's the little guy back there. But I've got a little technical glitch where my phone battery is trying to die. So I've got an extension cord plugged into my belt loop and then my charger plugged into that. So I'm going to attempt to not screw this up if I can. Let's see if we can flip the view around here. There we go. So this is the dyno cell and this is the project engine. So this thing is a, once again, 95 uh, IndyCar engine. Came, it was actually uh, in a Reynard chassis that Jacques Villeneuve drove in the 95 season. It is a turbocharged, single turbocharged uh, V8 Cosworth-based engine built in England. And it is 2.65 liters. Uh, so it runs uh, methanol for fuel. Obviously, it doesn't have a charge air heat exchanger here between the, the turbocharger and the engine. Um, but what it does have uh, in order to cool the charge is four what they call PCI, pre-compressor inlet injectors arranged in an array around the front of the compressor inlet. And I'll see, see if I can move around without unplugging myself from the wall to look at the inlet of the of the turbocharger so it's got some these are the pci injectors here and some of us have seen pictures of this from the face on without this assembly here on the front of it and you can see the four it's four side feed injector nozzles that spray fuel into the inlet of the compressor and obviously those are controlled by the ecu to control the temperature of the air charge and then it also has this interesting assembly here on the front, which isn't something you typically see. Now the air filter's on, so you don't get to see the, uh, you don't get to see the actual veins, but this ring, this sliding ring and this cam are actuated by the throttle linkage, which is actually here. It has eight barrel throttles inside the plenum in here, uh, down here in the runner. And then it has this linkage here, which is connected to what they call the ninth throttle. The ninth throttle is uh, meant to act along with these air director veins to help keep the car spooled up when you're at part throttle. So these veins inside here, if you take the air cleaner off, actually close down like almost like a little clamshell and they redirect the air into the turbo uh, at low speed so that the air is already going in the right direction. The turbo doesn't have to do the extra work of turning it to get it to go into the compressor wheel. And also it acts as a bit of a restriction which will help, if you want, sort of cavitate the turbo at part throttle uh, so that the turbo will rev up and therefore when you go back after the throttle you get boost instantaneously. Obviously it's waste gated like any turbo charge system would be and there's a waste gate here and another one on the other side of the engine and then it's got this interesting little big brown pop-off valve right on top of the plenum. Now this was a series controlled, boost controlled package. It ran uh, what is referred to as 45 inches of boost, which is an absolute pressure measurement that effectively means it ran about seven, seven and a half pounds of boost. And that was regulated by the sanctioning body with this pop-off valve assembly. So you can see the slots in here. It works just like a blow-off valve, only it's a bit more uh, involved than a standard blow-off valve would be. There's all sorts of regulators and springs and diaphragms inside of this, this assembly. And uh, incidentally, it has this little nipple here, and the nipple would be connected using a hose to the driver's helmet. And that would allow the driver to have an indication that the pop-off valve had actuated, which was important for Indy, because apparently as the pop-off would activate, you could get a little bit of uh, lift throttle if you want under or oversteer, and you don't want to have that when you're going 225 miles an hour into turn one, uh, at Indianapolis. So that was the function of this little nipple was to alert the driver using a hose to his helmet that hey the pop-off valve's opening get ready for the car to change attitude. The rest of the engine is pretty standard by you know is pretty normal by today's standards it's a four valve obviously quad cam V8 uh, single turbo it, it's 2.6 liters which makes it just about twice the size of a normal Suzuki Hayabusa engine just happens to be a V8 version of it. Um, all of, it's got all this gear drive assembly on the front. You can't even actually see the front of the crankshaft. Uh, we ended up having to mount a trigger wheel on this drive here, which drives at the same as camshaft speed. 
so that we could set the ignition timing because uh, we have no access to the crank. These assemblies run this as an oil pump. There's another oil pump on the other side and then we actually have a small drive mechanism that comes off and runs this mechanical fuel pump here on the engine dyno. In the car, the mechanical pump is driven the same way, but it's in the actual fuel cell of the vehicle. So this thing is a 2.6 liter. Uh, again, methanol M1, nothing special there. Kind of some normal boost control stuff here we have with the this uh, ridiculous mess of electronics back here in the back with a Motec M880 on it. Um, as standard sort of NTK, Uego, Lambda sensor. It has 16 injectors actually inside here, which you can't see uh, without the plenum being off because they're down on the back side of the runner. But there are 16 1200 cc emitted injectors there. And I don't know what the rating is of the four PCI injectors in front of the compressor, but based on the amount of fuel trim that I had to do, I would guess they are about one third uh, of 1200. So they're probably about 400 cc's a minute each, something like that. We've been running the engine because it is going to be used in a historic vehicle uh, to run around the racetrack with and go have fun. And that's why it got switched to Motec so that we have a way to tune it. You couldn't make much adjustment with the original control system and they were having some problems with it. And it was easier to switch it over than it was to try to figure out how to get back and, and fix what was there. I believe that uh, this is these are non-standard coils here. I'm not even sure it had a coil on plug. It may have. Uh, in its original form factor, but these are just standard motorcycle coil near plug or coil on plug coils like you'd have on a, on a CBR or Suzuki Hayabusa or any of the newer model uh, water cooled and fuel injected motorcycles that are on the market. Obviously, in the engine cell here, we have lots of other instrumentation, which you know Roush obviously uses for some of the other engines they run, and we're using some of that for what we're doing here today on the dyno. So. What I'm gonna do is try to unplug myself from the wall. Maybe it's better to just go actually to the wall and unplug myself. And I'll show you a picture or a screenshot, let's say, of the actual dyno graph from when we ran this thing earlier. And then I'll show you a picture of the car that the engine actually came out of. So this is, this is our best number on the dyno. This engine, when it raced back in the day, was rated at 750 horsepower. Uh, and we're right there at 750. That is actually the one run we decided to make all the way to uh, 12,500 RPM. So that's uh, just about 750 horsepower at 12,500. Obviously, because the engine's high revving, we start the dyno pull at about 8,000 RPM. And here's a good picture of the car that the engine actually came from. And Joe, that's the same car. It's going back in, yes, right? Sir. Right, so we have that same car and it's painted the same way? Right, so it's the same livery, same car. That's actually Jacques in the car in back from 95 season. Um, but that's the, uh, that's the scoop. So that's, that's what today is about. The last couple days have been that way here in Livonia uh, at the Roush Racing Dino Lab. And uh, yeah, that's kind of the long and short of it. And uh, yeah, I think that might be all I have to offer. Hopefully it's been uh, entertaining. It's certainly been entertaining trying to get this thing to run. It's, it's an interesting um, concept because normally when I'm brought into a, a project like this, I would be the one dictating how we were gonna control things. In this case, because it's historic and we're trying to keep it how it was, I have to adapt my thinking to the way they thought and the controls they had in the 90s for running these things. So we don't have standard references for uh, pressure to read pressure going into the engine. Uh, and or pressure going to the fuel pressure regulator and some of these things made it a little bit tricky compared to my Let's say current way of thinking about how to run or control something, but uh, it's made it fun So this is kind of a cool project I uh, don't get to work on a lot of these. This is my second IndyCar engine, but my first one with a turbocharger and uh, Yeah, it's been kind of cool and I'm looking forward to the next one. So hopefully that was entertaining uh, If it was give me a like you can follow me on Instagram, obviously Facebook, Tuned by Shane T. You can check out YouTube, Tuned by Shane T. And if you didn't like it, uh, why don't you share it anyway and say how much it sucked. The inlet guide vane, this device directs the air into the turbocharger to help increase the speed of the turbo at part throttle and therefore helps it spool. 
This other linkage on the back of the plenum is the ninth throttle blade. Together with the inlet guide vane, they both help recovery time of the turbo when you hit the throttle after you've been part throttle cruising around the racetrack. And of course these injectors here are the PCI injectors. Those are the four injectors that spray the fuel into the airstream into the compressor to cool the air charge. This is a close-up shot of the blow-off valve. Now this device was mandated by the series back in the day so that they could control the manifold pressure and they controlled it differently depending on which engine you ran. For example, if you ran the Indy V6 you got to run 55 inches of mercury manifold pressure versus the 45 allowed to this Cosworth. So this device acts like a blow-off valve on a normal turbocharged engine, except it's controlled by the series to maintain parity between the engine combinations. At this point, you're probably asking yourself, particularly if you have any experience with turbochargers, why would anyone in their right mind go to all this trouble to regulate the manifold pressure on something that only makes seven pounds of boost. And you're not alone. But an interesting thing can happen on a turbocharged engine at part throttle. And that is that uh, if you're under the right conditions of the right amount of throttle opening, and particularly the right RPM, you can send enough energy into the turbine that the turbo will suddenly spool up. And so as a driver, where the driver has his foot at a constant throttle position, particularly if he's entering a corner. Uh, he's expecting a sort of linear power delivery, and suddenly if the turbo spools up, he gains power without requesting it, which apparently makes them uneasy. Which is why they've gone to all the trouble to try to cure that with this arrangement. I don't know what it's going to take, but I know what I'm going to use. Once the calibration's finished, the job's not done. You got to drive it around on the dyno a little bit and look for holes. Thousand or something, maybe it'll be the same thing, jockey in and out of it. Try uh, 11 or something and let it see it rev up a little bit more. Good. Runs just like it had a carburetor. <laughs> 